I want to talk to you this morning about three men who saw Jesus in a way that no one else did when he walked the earth. We'll pick up the story in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, we'll begin in verse 1. It says this, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus t charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that uh, Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said, Unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things, but I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whosoever, uh, whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now, uh, I think we, we can very easily miss uh, much of the significance of, of this passage of Scripture, the transfiguration of Jesus. So we're going to try not to by, uh, by slowing down and walking through it verse by verse to understand what's meant here. Uh, but here are three men, Peter, James, and John, that go up with Jesus to the top of a mountain. And uh, at the mountain top, according to Luke, they went up there to pray with him. And when they get up there, Jesus, his his appearance changes. He, he's bright and shining like the sun, so, so strong that they couldn't look at him. It was, it was the, the brilliance of, of light that was coming off of him. And the Bible says that his clothes became white like snow, kind of like when you walk outside and, and uh, maybe after a, a snowstorm, but the sun has come out and it's, you have to squint because of the light bouncing from the sun off of the snow. You can't even open your eyes fully. This is the idea that, that's being given. His clothes become bright white, and they shine in the brilliance of the light that comes from his face. And with him appear Moses and Elijah. Now, some skeptic might say, well, that just seems too fantastic to be true. But remember, Jesus is the creator of the universe, so this is not beyond the realm of his possibility. He can do that if he wants to. This is not something that cannot be done. But we're told something very fascinating here. Uh, let's begin in verse 1 and let's find some things that ask some questions about it and find what is significant here. Notice it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. The after six days is going to be very important in just a moment, but let's hang on to that for a minute. And let's ask the question, why in the world does Jesus take only Peter, James, and John? These are three of his 12 apostles, his 12 disciples. Why didn't he bring all of them up the mountain? Why did he bring Peter, James, and John? Now, actually, this is not something, this is not the first time that Jesus only brought Peter, James, and John to do something for him. He brings only Peter, James, and John to come with him into the house of Jairus to, uh, when he's going to raise his daughter, uh, Jairus' daughter, from the dead. 
Uh, he brings only Peter, James, and John in for that. When they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus is praying, he brings Peter, James, and John a little further into the garden, closer to where he's praying. And, you know, you have to ask the question, what in the world? Why Peter, James, and John? It seems like if, of all the apostles, they would be the worst ones to choose. Peter's the one who's always sticking his foot in his mouth and doing some, making some foolish statements. And James and John were known as the thun- sons of thunder. They, uh, <laughs> they, liked to, they were fiery individuals. They came up to Jesus one time and said, hey, Lord, you know, these people are rejecting you. Will you just, you know, bring fire down from heaven and just destroy them, you know? And Jesus said, no, we're not going to do that. (laughs) Uh, So you you would think that Peter, James, and John would be the last ones. That would be the three that Jesus chose to, you know, separate from the others. And I think maybe that's why Jesus chose Peter, James, and John. (laughs) Maybe they need a little bit more work than the rest of the, of the apostles, you know? They need a little bit more attention. Um, but it's a beautiful picture because, of course, Jesus chose 12 apostles as a picture of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. This was all a beautiful picture that he was starting a new idea of what God's people were. God's people are, are going to be the church. And he was doing that by starting with a 12 the same way as God's people in the Old Testament started with the number 12, the 12 sons of Jacob. And remember the 12 sons of Jacob? There's three sons out of the 12 sons of Jacob that sort of stand out for just, you know, the worst reasons, but end up becoming very significant. They are Judah and Levi and Joseph. Now, Judah is a terrible guy. I mean, this man, uh, you know, commits, you know, acts that shouldn't be committed with his daughter-in-law thinking that she's a prostitute, which doesn't make it any better, okay? And, uh, and yet God uses him. And there's a man who, uh, called Levi who, with his brother, go and he kills an entire city of people. He tricks them into uh, weakening themselves, and then he goes and kills the entire city of men, all the men in the city of Shechem. Uh, and uh, these are people who, who did terrible, evil sins. And then Joseph, who everybody, you know, made fun of, all the other brothers thought the least of Joseph, of all the, of all the brothers, they sold him into slavery. And yet we find that these become the most significant of all the other tribes of Israel, all the sons of Jacob. From the line of Judah comes the kings of Israel. From the line of Levi comes the priests of Israel. And from Joseph, Joseph becomes the one who sort of saves them all from the famine, brings them into Egypt. And then his sons, one of them being Ephraim, becomes sort of like the figurehead of the northern kingdom of Israel. A lot of times when they talk about the northern kingdom after the two kingdoms split, they talk about the northern kingdom as if it's just Ephraim. They talk about the whole thing as Ephraim because Joseph becomes the figurehead. His son, Ephraim, becomes the figurehead of the northern kingdom. So of all the 12 tribes, there's three that just stand out. And you'd think they'd be the last ones to stand out as leaders in the 12 tribes, and yet those are the ones that God chose. In the same way, Jesus chooses three, the, the, mo- the mo- least likely of the three of his apostles, and those are the ones that sort of stand out. And it's James, John, James and his brother John, and then Peter. And so here he goes, he takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Now, in the book of Luke, we're told that the reason they went up there was to pray. Jesus says, all right, Peter, James, and John, you you guys have been especially out of, uh, uh, you know, out of hand lately, so let's go pray for a minute. (laughs) And he brings them apart uh, to pray on on this mountain, but he has something special in mind beyond prayer. It says, verse 2, and he was and was transfigured before them. Now, pay close attention to how how he's described. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now, this is, this is a really important description. If you'll turn with me to the book of Revelation, one of these three apostles was going to see Jesus like this again later in his life. Uh, G- they, these three, Peter, James, and John, after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, 
would later live much longer after Jesus ascended into heaven. And John was the last to die. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. James was the first of all the apostles to be killed for the cause of Christ. And John was the last of all the apostles to be killed for the cause of Christ, to die for Christ. Uh, And here we go, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. We can begin reading in verse 9. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is later in John's life. John was sentenced to death for, uh, for preaching the gospel of Christ. They covered him in tar and set him on fire, and he didn't die. So they said, well, if that's not going to kill him, we'll just exile him to the Isle of Patmos, and this is where he is. And while he's there, it says, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Now that's the phrase that Jesus used to refer to himself, Son of Man. And John is saying, I saw someone who looked just like Jesus. Now John knows what Jesus looks like, right? Um, You know, they didn't have photographs of Jesus, but John knew what Jesus looked like because he's seen him before. He says, I saw, saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Sounds a lot like his his garments on the Mount of Transfiguration. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Look at this next phrase. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. This is exactly what we're told about what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, his face began to shine so bright, it was like looking at the sun. You know, they had to shield their eyes. The the idea here is that Jesus is displaying to them his full glory. So much that they had to turn their eyes away because they're realizing just how glorious this guy is. Now before this, Jesus looks like a regular human being. And and the book of Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 53 about the Messiah saying, oh, you know, there's... You know, when he comes, there's no beauty that we're going to desire of him. There's no form or comeliness. I mean, he just, you know, he just looks like a regular guy. I'd like to think that Jesus was bald. I mean, I'd like to think, you know, maybe he was. Maybe he was short. You know, we don't think about that. But Jesus, the Bible says that he wasn't very attractive. He was just a regular guy, you know. But when he went up to the top of that mountain, it was clear that he was more than just a regular guy, you know. He obviously, of course, that was already clear because he was performing miracles and teaching things uh, that were very clearly that pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah and he was God in human flesh. But this became very obvious when he goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. It becomes visibly clear. Uh, look with me, if you would, at the book of First John. Uh, and it's a, just one verse, so if you don't feel like turning there, don't don't worry, I'll turn there for you. First John chapter 3, here's another thing written by the same apostle, the apostle John, and he wrote this in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him like he is. 
Yeah, John makes it clear that it is really very difficult to even look at Jesus the way that he truly is in his full radiance and splendor and glory unless we are given new bodies with eyes that can actually look at the sun because he is so radiant and bright in order to see him as he is we'll also have to be like him we'll have to be given brand new bodies when we get to heaven and when we see Jesus this is the beautiful radiance and glory and splendor that's displayed here on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we can go even a little further than that. We can make another statement about what, what they saw there on that mountain. Look with me, if you would, at Matthew. We're back at Matthew 17, but we're going to back up just one verse to Matthew 28. We'll back up a little further in just a minute, but I want to start by backing up just to verse 28 of chapter 16. And this is the verse right before chapter 17 begins. Remember that the chapter breaks were put in afterwards. They're not part of the actual, you know, scripture. It was just put in to help us find our place. And in verse 28, we see this, Verily I say unto you, there shall there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now there's three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who write about this same event, tell us about how it happened. And all three of them, all three of them, when they record the transfiguration, the walking up the mountain to the transfiguration, they all mention that it happens a week after the preceding statement. They all want us to know, they all tell us about this preceding statement, that some here will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, and then they all say, "Go! oh, a week later, they went up a mountain and they saw Jesus. And what does he look like when they see him? They, he looks the same way he does in the book of Revelation when John sees what he looks like when he comes in his kingdom. You see, here we're told that what they saw was Jesus in his eternal kingdom form. When Jesus returns to set up the kingdom of God on this earth, and he will do that one day. You know, we, get, we complain about the kingdoms of this earth and for, for good reasons. But um, don't forget that these are all temporary. There is a coming kingdom of God on this earth, and he is returning. He is going to establish it. And by the way, this is what he's going to look like when he comes in brilliance and glory and in splendor. This, he says, he says, some of you, not all of you, just some of you, are going to see the, 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 the Messiah, the kingdom of God, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, in his kingdom form. And then he takes them a week later, only some of them, not all of them, up a mountain and he shows them, he gives them the fulfillment of that. Now I want you to watch this because this, that's an important foundation to see. Because I think we're going to find that we can learn a little bit from Peter. You know, if you ever feel like you identify with Peter... When he says, I'll never deny you, and then a few hours later, he's denying Christ, you know. Um, you know, he seems very filled with, uh, with vigor for the Lord, and then he fails all the time. He's always sticking his foot in his mouth. I feel like that's, you know, that my mother should have named me Peter, maybe. But uh, she would agree with that. <laughs> but uh, look at this. It says, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah. That's Elijah, the, the Greek uh, tra- when you take it from Greek and translate it to English, it looks like Elias, uh, but it's the same Hebrew word as Elijah. So Moses and Elijah appear there talking with him. And how do they know that it's Moses and Elijah? I mean, they don't know what Moses and Elijah look like. They're listening to them talk, right? Jesus perhaps says, hey, Moses. <laughs> hey, Elijah. Nice to see you guys. What's up? You know, um, as a matter of fact, we're told what they talk about. In the book of Luke, chapter 9, we're told that they, they are talking, Jesus and Moses and Elijah are talking about how Jesus is going to Jerusalem and he's going to die there and rise again three days later. Now, why would he be talking to Moses and Elijah about this? Well, I have uh, theories about that. I think I can answer that, but we, we may say, save that for the end if we have time. <laughs> Uh, But at any rate, Jesus was talking to them about about where he's going next. Now, remember, as we're reading through the narrative of Matthew, this is where everything starts to change 
for Jesus, if, if you will, he, he makes a, a strong emphasis on going to Jerusalem because this time when he goes to Jerusalem, again, this is not the first time he goes to Jerusalem in his ministry, but then his next, he's going to stop at several places along the way, but now he's headed to Jerusalem where he's going to be put to death. And he keeps warning his disciples, hey, I'm going to be put to death, but don't, don't worry, I'm going to rise again three days later. And they're all thinking, yeah, okay, I wonder what that's a parable about, you know. No, no, like, really, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again three days later. Okay, Lord, all right. Um, now, I want you to see this, because if we back up just a few verses into chapter 16, we can see Peter's attitude about this. Look at what it says in, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> verse number 13. Uh, we won't read all of this. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it. Jesus uh, asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And uh, they say, well, some say that you're Jeremiah the prophet, and some say you're Elijah the prophet, and, you know, and, and, uh, and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter comes out and he says it, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one who's going to bring in the kingdom of God. Now, they should all have known that, but Peter was bold enough to say it. Kudos to him. He, boldness was never really a problem of Peter's. <laughs> um, Jesus says to him, blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonah, because your, your flesh and your blood, meaning your heritage, hasn't showed this to you, um, but that was revealed to you by the Father. That's true. Nobody can say Jesus is the Messiah, he's the son of God, um, because, you know, because of their you know, pedigree or because of some good that's within them. It's all because Christ. God leads us to that conclusion. So it's a wonderful thing. He's saying, this does no credit to you, Peter, by the way. He says, you're Peter, which is a, name, which is a word that, that Jesus used as a name for Peter. It's a word that means little stone. And, it, uh, and he says, you're Peter, this little stone, but I'm going to use you. And uh, actually, we find out later, he's going to use all the apostles as the foundation of his church. We see this in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, where the new Jerusalem descends from God out of heaven. It's a picture of the bride, meaning the bride of Christ, God's people. And the foundation stones of the city are, have names on them, and they're the 12 names of the 12 uh, apostles of Jesus Christ. Uh, you see, Jesus was using them as the beginning of his church, all 12 of them. And so he say, makes this statement to Peter, you're, you're just this little stone, you're Peter, but I'm going to build my church starting with you 12, and, uh, and, and he says this, he says, verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, a lot of people have argued over what this is, what the keys of the kingdom of heaven are. I really don't think it should be controversial at all. I think it's actually rather simple. If you look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells us this, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which, ye have, uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Paul says, well, here's the way into the kingdom. It's the gospel. And then he says, here's what the gospel is, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is actually rather, rather simple. Paul says this is how the kingdom of heaven is unlocked. This is how people gain citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. It is by believing the gospel that we are sinners, that we deserve the judgment of God, but Jesus died for our sins on the cross, he died and suffered what we deserved. And so he died, was buried, he rose again to prove that he was who he said he was. And now we just turn to him and say, yes, yes, I want you to be the Lord of my life because me living for myself is headed towards the judgment of God and turning to Christ in repentance and faith is the key to the kingdom of heaven. And so here we go. He says, he says to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, meaning I'm going to give you the gospel, and 
Then he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's now putting the onus on Peter. He says, I'm giving you the key to unlock the gate to the kingdom, as it will, uh, uh, if you will. And then he says, but if you don't unlock it, if you don't give people the gospel, if you don't tell them the truth about how they can be part of the kingdom of heaven by believing the gospel and repenting of their sins, well then, you're actually, you're not just not unlocking the door, you're actually binding them up and keeping them from getting there because they don't know how to get there. So he says, not only do you have to unlock the door, but if you don't unlock the door, you've locked them up. You've, in a, in a sense, you've taken them and you've bound them up so they can't go. Your job now is, uh, Peter, is to give the gospel to others. And now, he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now look at the next few verses. Um, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. What did Paul say is the keys to the kingdom? The, the way to enter into the kingdom of God, to be saved, it is the gospel. And he said, what's the gospel? That Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, now let me explain. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again the third day. He's giving them the keys. He's giving them the gospel. And what does Peter say in response when Jesus gives him the key? Verse 22 then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter says, No, you're not going to die. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel. This is God's plan for the redemption of mankind. I'm going to die for their sins. And then if they believe and repent, they have salvation. It's that simple. And Peter says, No, no. Great job, Peter. You already missed the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> Verse 23, Jesus says to Peter, he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God. He said, no, this is of God, Peter. You, you don't see how it could be of God, but it is. It's, my, it's the plan. It's my plan. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He says, listen, it's not going to be the way that you want it to be. If you're going to follow me, you've got to be willing to die. You've got to take up your cross. That was like saying, you know, march over to your electric chair. You know, uh, this is a, an instrument of death, right? He says, take up your cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall will lose his life for my sake, shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in his glory and of his Father with his angels, and, when he, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the, king, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He says, when I come, when I come back again, that's when things get good for you. Before then, you have to be willing to die for me. I'm not promising you that everything's good, and you shouldn't expect that the Messiah is here to, you know, to live a comfortable life. The Messiah was there the first time, Jesus, to die. He comes the second time to rule and to reign. We are not here in this life to rule and to reign and to have all the comforts and pleasures of this life. We're here to live for him, to share the gospel so that others can be part of the kingdom. And then we get to enjoy the kingdom one day. That's, that's the wonderful thing that's waiting for us. And so Peter, Peter slips up, right? He messes up badly. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. He turns around and gives him the keys. And, and Peter says, no. And then he says, hey, some of you are going to see the Son of Man coming in his glory uh, before you die. And now he sees the Son of Man coming in his glory before he dies on the top of the mountain. Jesus is transfigured. His face is shining like the sun. And look at what Peter says. Verse 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You can tell that Peter doesn't know what to say. As a matter of fact, in Mark and Luke, when they record this account, they say, for he 
knew not what to say. <laughs> he just says, oh, this is a wonderful thing, Lord. Um, okay, yeah, it's good. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. You know, here's the thing, and maybe this is a good, good little side lesson for all of us Peters out there. Sometimes when you just don't know what to say, you shouldn't say anything at all, you know? I think that's a, just a good rule of thumb, and I'm working on it myself. But uh, <laughs> here is, now, now Moses and Elijah, there's no reason for us to think that they, they were sh faces were shining or that they were brilliant or anything like this. They were just two guys, and they knew they were Moses and Elijah because Jesus was talking to them, right? Um, but here Peter is like, oh, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, of course, uh, but we'll also build a tabernacle for Moses and a tabernacle for Elijah, and let's just honor all three of these these people, as if they were all equal. But, but they're not. I mean, Jesus is revealing his glory and his splendor in front of, in front of Peter. And Peter, Peter, you know, lets, lets his tongue a little bit looser than it should be. And it says, so in response, the heavenly Father speaks. It says, verse 5, while he yet spake, while, while Peter is speaking and saying, hey, let's Let's build tabernacles for all three of you. While he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and the old voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Meaning, forget about Moses and Elijah. Now, it's interesting. You could read back in Deuteronomy, how, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. It, there's a prophecy that God will raise up, the Messiah will be a prophet that God raises up like unto Moses. And at the end of Deuteronomy, Joshua or somebody later writes in at the end of Deuteronomy that there was no prophet that had ever come in, in Israel since then like Moses. Like that prophecy hadn't been fulfilled. It's fulfilled in Jesus, right? Moses is used by God to part the Red Sea, and power over waters and things like that. You know, of course, God does the work, but Moses is used to do those things. And Jesus is calming the sea. He's walking on the water. Uh, Moses is used by God to bring you know, manna down from heaven to feed the people. Jesus feeds 5,000 and, and produces miraculous bread. Uh, Jesus is showing throughout his ministry that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. You see, Moses was just a giant arrow that was pointing to Jesus. That's all Moses is. He was like a shadow of the real thing who's Jesus. Elijah was a great prophet. I mean, he did many, many mighty works, but nothing like Jesus. Elijah um, didn't heal the type, the, the amount of people that Jesus healed. Elijah didn't raise anybody from the dead the way that Jesus raised people from the dead. Elijah didn't cast out demons the way Jesus cast out demons. You see, all of these other, all these other things in the Bible are meant to be giant, you know, flashing neon signs that, that give us a, a magnificent arrow that points us directly to Jesus. And Peter missed it. <laughs> he missed the whole thing. And he's looking at everything else. Uh, but he didn't miss it permanently. Turn with me and we'll close here to the book of, the book of 1 Peter. 2 uh, Peter, excuse me. In the book of 2 Peter, Peter is writing and he refers to this event. And it seems like he finally starts to get it. Verse number 16. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter is saying, all those stories that you read about in the Gospels, we didn't just make those up. We, this, we're giving you eye." witness testimony. We were there. We saw it. We're, we're, we're telling you what happened. Verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, Peter's talking about that moment when the God, the Father in heaven, interrupted his foolish ramblings in order to remind everyone that the glorious one who deserves the honor is Christ and Christ alone. Um, so he says, remember that when he received 
from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18, he says, And this voice which came from heaven we heard, meaning him and James and John, when we were with him in the holy mount. He says, I remember when I heard that voice saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I remember the glory of Jesus. I'm telling you what I saw with my eyes. Then he says, verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Essentially what Peter is saying here is, I saw Jesus with my own eyes. I can tell you what I saw. I heard it from heaven, the declaration that he is the beloved son, that he is the son of God. I saw his glory. I saw it so so bright that I couldn't even remain looking at it. I fell down in fear and started saying things that made me look kind of foolish. I saw all of that. But he says, you have something even greater than my experience. And that is the the testimony of the word of God. He says, the holy men of old who wrote this down, wrote it as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Literally, when we open the Bible, we are reading the words of the Holy Spirit that he inspired the, the authors of the Bible to write. He, 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 he inspired them to write it down. They wrote it down. And that's what we have when we open our Bibles and read it. Someone says, man, I really wish that God would talk to me. I say, read your Bible because he does talk. He's actually not only has he spoken, but he's spoken and he's had it written down for us. And what? does the whole Bible point us to? It doesn't point us to Moses. It's fun to study Moses and to learn more about him. It doesn't point us to Elijah. It's fun to study Elijah and learn more about him. It doesn't point us to Peter. Although we've studied Peter today and learned a little bit more about him, but all of this is meant to point us to Jesus Christ. All of it is meant to help us see Jesus for who he is. That we would look full in his wonderful face. That the things of this earth would grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus is the one that the whole scripture is about. The whole thing is meant to show us that we are sinners destined for eternal damnation in hell and Christ is is the love of God to us. He came to die for our sins to show that God doesn't want you to face the wrath and judgment. He wants you to have salvation forever. He wants you to be part of the kingdom of God. And here we are, and we say, if I believe that, if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again, I have a choice now to make, and if I've chosen Jesus Christ as the Lord, he's the master, meaning I've, I've repented. I'm not going to live for myself. I'm living for him now. That is what gains a person entrance into heaven. You say, because of my faith in the gospel, I'm choosing Christ as the Lord. I'm making him the Lord. This is, this is what the whole Bible is about. And then after we choose Christ, we are to continue to learn more about him and look into his brilliant face and grow closer to him and live our lives in accordance with what he's given us because that's what the Holy Spirit, God himself, spoke and wrote and gave to us. And Peter says, you know, being on that mountain and seeing Jesus transfigured was wonderful, but I have something that's more wonderful. It's the entire word of God that he's inspired. And this is even better. This is even greater. Because I learn more about Jesus here than I can in one moment looking at his brilliance and glory. I can actually learn more about it as I read the pages of Scripture where Jesus is declared to us, where God doesn't just say he's my beloved son, he says so much more about who Jesus is. 
This is why we come together on a day like today. It is to learn a little bit more about who Jesus is, to spend some time in the radiant splendor of his face. This is what the Christian life is all about. And if there's going to be a revival of Christians in our country, it's going to be because of this one thing. A view of who Jesus is. And uh, an increased view daily in our lives where we become more and more aware of what he is, who he is, what he wants from us, and how better to live for him. Let's determine to do that today.